say now we're joined by Humphrey Kelleher. Humphrey, how are things? Well, lads, I really have made it now when I get onto your show. I tell oh. you, you're the number one. Well, we appreciate that. Um, Humphrey, any, any thoughts on, on the club over the weekend? We want to talk about your book shortly. But first off, what did you make of the club stuff over the weekend? Well, I suppose the, the, the two best teams won. It's as simple as that. Uh, Kiladangan really shot themselves in the foot by having the two men sent off. But I, I was very impressed with um, Buddy Gunner. <clears throat> and uh, now they did leave the goal in at the very end, which, you know, put a bit of gloss on the uh, scoreline um, for Napierschik. But I think there's about five or six of that Napierschik team on the Limerick senior hurling team are certainly on the panel, on the greater panel. And uh, you see a team from Waterford, I, I think it was two guys on the Waterford team, uh, and then they're able to beat an Apiercy team. So there's something wrong with the equation of inter-county and inter-club. But Ballygunner have fantastic spirit and determination. It's a pity we hadn't about five other clubs in Waterford to have the same thing. We might have a good county team then. Is that a bit of a problem, Humphrey? You obviously a, a former Waterford goalkeeper. Is that like where do you where do you think Waterford are at the minute? It was a bit of a disastrous twenty twenty three. Well, I'll sum it up in one very simple um, uh, comment: is that the Harty Cup is the big competition, Shane, that you know in Munster for the schools. There are twenty one teams in that. There are seven from Cork. There's five from Tipperary. There's four from Limerick. Three from Clare, and one from Waterford. Now, how can they compete with that? And when you have teams of the strength of those other counties competing at that level, because that's where it starts. And if you're not able to compete at the underage level at schools, you're certainly not going to be able to compete at the higher level at senior. And that, to me, is one of the major problems. And it is epitomised in the last couple of years. Funny enough, when they got into the All-Ireland minor there a couple of years ago and the other 21, they, were, they won two All-Irelands. But it was on the back of De La Salle and Dungarvan Colleges coming through and winning the Munster Championship. So there is a correlation between those two. And that's where the issue is. And irrespective of who manages them, you know, whether it's Davy or Michael Verney or Shane, it doesn't matter. You, only, you can only deal with what you have, the players, what you have. And if they are not up to standard, I'm afraid they're not going to be able to compete. Mm, yeah. Uh, Humphrey, can we talk to you about your book? I'm just going to bring it up on, on screen here. So, A Place to Stay. Can you tell us about um, what was the inspiration for this? You know, so it's the story behind 101 GA grounds. What was the inspiration that got this book going and, and what was it like trying to put it together? It took me 10 years, Shane. I had written a book a couple of years, 10 years ago. I launched a book called The GA Family Silver, which is really about the, the cups and uh, the GA cups have been presented. So, I decided. Let's look at this particular um, the history of the GAA, which to me, you know, has a marvellous history, but it's not recorded. And I have to say at the outset that this is not a one man show. It put, as a team to put this together, while I'm the author as such, I had to go around the country and I had one person from each province. I had a fantastic editor in Kerry. I had a designer from Mayo. I had a uh, uh, Donna McAnallen that you probably know of in, in, in Ulster that helped me and I brought great uh, publishers in Leinster in, in, um, in Newbridge. So it did take a team but it took an awful lot of work and I would have decided when I saw that there was very little um, number of uh, photographs of good grounds available I decided to go and take the, <laughs> take the photographs myself at my age. I bought a drone and I put it up in the sky and I took all the photographs of all the grounds. Now, it was a labour of love to be quite in interesting uh, stories that I came across by visiting all those grounds. And it was marvellous. And the GA should be very, very proud of what it has got. It is probably the biggest real estate owner of grounds in the country. And they should be proud of every single one of them. Mm. Can, I, can I ask you actually just about the naming of cups? It always comes to mind any time I hear it. But the, formerly, the, the Munster Intermediate Cup used to be the Sweet After Cup. Of course, it's the Great Cup. And I know this is about the about the stadiums or whatever. But like, have you come across any other mad names for cups? Ah, uh, well, there was there was the um, I suppose the, the the Irish Press Cup. Well, the papers now gone out of uh, existence. Um, but the uh, the the very interesting story about I don't know Shane if you know the story about the Sweet After Cup, but it was. Um, uh, there was a man who played in 1920 with Michael Hogan in Bloody Sunday. 
uh, Jerry Clan uh, Melman, and he actually worked with um, the cigarette company Carl's, and they made the cigarettes called Sweet Afton. And Sweet Afton actually is the name of a poem by Robbie Burns in Scotland. And uh, he, Robbie Burns' sister uh, is buried in Dundalk. So Carl's decided, well, we'll call it name in memory of Robbie Burns' sister. And uh, Jerry Shelley is the guy from um, uh, um, Carrick and Shore who actually donated the cup. But Jerry Shelley, as I say, I have a photograph in that book of Jerry Shelley and Michael Hogan the day of Bloody Sunday in 1920. So that's where that uh, particular uh, name came from. Uh, but there, there are, I suppose, there's 101 cups around the country that uh, they, they, they have been named. And uh, I suppose that was one of the most interesting ones. Um, there was the um, the one after the TWA Cup. Now, you'd be too young, lads, to remember what TWA it was Trans World Airlines, which ultimately became American Airlines. And they were based in Shannon. And there was a man called Michael um, Hamilton, uh, Cannon Hamilton, uh, wanted to raise money for the GAA. The and name he of the actually, trophy, yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's the very same man, Michael. He actually asked the guy in. Um, in, in TWA, would you give us a few bob? So he did. He said, as long as you call the cup after uh, uh, TWA cup, an American American airline, which which is now no longer in existence. So maybe it's time, Shane, that we might consider uh, calling it maybe the uh, Shane Stapleton Cup, maybe or something like that. And I go out of existence. Oh God, no! No, no one would want to play for it. I said, I to be honest with you. Well, maybe nobody wants to win it. <laughs> <laughs> Humphrey, just just on just on the book, um, an unbelievable labour of love. You've basically gone through every county ground in the thirty-two counties across the country. Um, there must have been some good stories that cropped up along the way. Um, talking to various people on the grounds, anything in particular kind of stand out? Ah, uh, there was lots of them, Michael, and it's interesting you should say that. And some of them made the book, and some of them didn't make the book. But uh, there was one there in uh, Kilkenny, in um, in John Locke's, which is uh, in Callan. And uh, they were playing in the minor hurling final in uh, Mullen Nevat. And uh, the bus uh, brought the team, and the people cycled all those days, Michael, back in the 50s, to these matches. And anyway, the cyclists, and anyway, when the band came to march into the... Um, uh, the the Mullinavat pitch. There was um, about twenty guys in the in 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 the uh, band, but by the time they went through, there was about sixty. And one of the stewards said to the other stewards, "God, that's one of the biggest bands I ever had." What happened is when the lads took off the bikes, they put the uh, the, the the pumps up to their mouths as if they were doing a whistle, and they were they were joined the band and got in that way. So that was a, a one of the stories. But uh, the name of the ground in Canada is John Locke. And uh, John Locke's Park, lovely, lovely ground. But when President Reagan came to Ireland back in the 1984, um, John Locke was a poet and he cited, he recited uh, one of the poems by John Locke, which was very, very good. Uh, one of the grounds that I also went to was um, uh, Bagnestown in County Carlow, uh, which was uh, uh, named um, um, the, um, uh, uh, oh, sorry, I forget the name now. Um, uh, um, I'm sorry, Michael. Um, Humphrey, you've got many names in your head. You cannot remember them all. Um, the, but, the, but, the, but the ground actually was a, a McGrath, Daniel McGrath Park. McGrath Park Memorial Park, it's called. But Daniel McGrath was a member of a family that three brothers came to Dublin. And, uh, happened, uh, came to Dublin. Um, uh, the, 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 the money would go to building a hall, which they did, uh, the McGrath Memorial Hall, and then that they would build a sports ground for the people of Bagnestown. And any person, a girl who was born in Bagnestown and married uh, in Bagnestown, she got a dowry of £25 from the McGrath Memorial Fund. 
So that was another one. But one of the ones, one of the good ones was, I suppose, in uh, uh, you, you, you. Uh, I suppose there's uh, loads of them there. But one of the ones was up in um, McHale Park in um, uh, in, in Castle Bar, where there was um, during the war there was 1940s, and uh, the government said to the um, people when well, you grow your own vegetables like we're short of vegetables so they gave them an allotment in the ground of uh, castle bar uh, right beside it and uh, so people were growing carrots and vegetables and potatoes and rhubarb or what else but didn't some of them decide to encroach onto the pitch so half the sideline was full of carrots and and parsnips that people were able to grow in the place and that caused a bit of a problem um, and I suppose w w one other one is was in in um, in Beacon in 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 Mayo where they have the dome. They have a marvelous dome up there now. Uh, credit to John Prenty, but I put the drone up to um, to take a photograph of a picture of the drone, and I didn't realize that behind the goal was a net, and the net uh, the drone got caught about a hundred feet up in the oh. net, and I had no way of getting it down. So that caused a bit of a problem. Um, and the last one I tell you is about Coot Hill in Cavan, where uh, I went up with the drone. And of course, what happened was the the the, the, the local groundsman came up to me and said, "Are you are you all right, lads?" That's, that, that was a question, by the way, Michael, that everybody said to us when we arrived. Are you all right? As if to say, "What? What in the name of Jesus are you doing here?" But anyway, I put the drone up and I showed him how was what the drone was doing. And he said, "God Almighty," he says, "Why didn't you tell me you were coming?" And I said, "Why?" He said. He said, I'd have cut the grass for you, he says. So those <laughs> very important, those very guys, important. <laughs> but those guys are very, very proud of their grounds. And, you know, that you have, uh, I suppose, memorial to those grounds. Now, one of the best grounds, of course, in the country, most historic. And I have to say, it, I call it the, the ground of firsts. It's a place in Offaly. I don't know if you know, but it's called Burr. <laughs> and Burr, Burr was open in 1928. And, uh, you know, it was, it, was, it was actually, the land was bought, Michael, for, for 400 pounds, which is hard to believe. But it was, it has a number of firsts. The first All-Ireland final, as you know, it was 19, yeah. uh, 1887 final, which was played on the 1st of April, 1888, where Tip beat Galway by 1-1 to, to, to no score. It was the first ground ever to have a um, Leinster minor hurling match played there in 1928 when Offaly played Leash. The first All Ireland club final was played yeah. there between St. Rhinus and Ross Gray. And it also uh, hosted uh, an All Ireland junior football final uh, where Sligo beat uh, Tipperary. But in my research, Michael, I came across, I couldn't believe it because I thought you were a relatively young man, but I saw in 1970 that you were the uh, treasurer of the uh, <laughs> County Board. Is that right? I mean, I really thought you were a bit younger than you are now. I'd be very good with my fingers, Humphrey. Um, that's my that's my uh, that's my granduncle Mick, who, funnily enough, the the Offaly Senior B Trophy is actually named after. So I played for our second team in the Senior B competition this year, and had we got to the final, Michael Verney would have been playing for the Michael Verney Cup. Unfortunately, it di it didn't ha it did it didn't happen. That would have been a that would have been a nice touch. But yeah, there's some there's some great history around St Brendan's Park and. There's some great history around like all the grounds. I, I, I've looked through the book. I spent about an hour in Easton's one day going through it, Humphrey. It's the sort of thing, because there's 101 different stories, and within those stories, there's loads of different stories. It's the sort of thing you can pick up, read about Sligo today, and tomorrow pick it up, read about Cavan or whatever. There's a great breadth to it, and I'd say, like, it's not just the GA book, Humphrey. I'd say it's a, it's a social history book on this as well. I think you hit the nail on the head, Michael. It certainly is. And if you think back in the days when the GA was formed in 1884, I mean, it was very much it was, it was, it was wound up in the Irish uh, Republican movement. And as a consequence of that, they couldn't get anybody to give them land. And they were dependent very much on local farmers to give them a few bob or uh, give them a pitch for uh, for a match. Now, whether they'd have it Next week is it was questionable. So they were really going from Billy to Jack in a very, very difficult uh, 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 situation for them. And as a consequence of that, they couldn't really develop it. And, and because they didn't know where they were going to be next week. 
But after a while, they actually, um, in the 1930s, uh, that uh, people came into power and uh, there was uh, Parik O'Keefe, who, who, who was uh, um, the um, Orchard Hoar, and a man called Martin O'Neill and Sean McCarthy. They were the drivers of this. They start off a revolution of giving money to the clubs and the counties to be able to develop those grounds. Because what they had to have to raise money in the clubs, they had to have an enclosed area. So therefore, they had to put up barriers or walls or something like that. And that cost money. So they were able to give money to those particular grounds to, uh, to, to, to develop them. And over a period of time, as I say, they were able to raise their own money. Uh, and of course, they, the, the, the amazing thing about it is that the amount of uh, work that these people did to raise money themselves, uh, they didn't sit around. I call them the, the real, the, 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 they are not maybe the real heroes, but they're heroes of the GAA. Mm. The mm. people don't put their hands in their pockets. The people who decided I'm going to out and I'm going to run a J week, I'm going to run a Kaylee, I'm going to have a draw for a heifer, I'm going to draw for a car. All those people, that's how they raised the money. And that wasn't easy. And now these grounds, Michael, in my view, is they're they're woven into the fabric of local society. And you know, uh, and, and 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 the grounds themselves became what they call a, a place of pilgrimage. You know, they went after the big match during the day. They went down to the Munster final. Where did they go to the Munster final? They went to Thurles. Where did they go to the Ulster final? They went to uh, Clonus. Where did they go to the Alliance final? It was a day out. And all of those particular um, grounds have a strong attachment to those people who go to it. And the amount of stories that those people have told us, they dressed up in the morning, they went to mass in their shirt, in their tie, in their hat, and off they went to the matches, and most of them cycled to games. So it was a rich tapestry of people who actually went to those particular games and enjoyed the, the, the day out. What's the club on the front cover? I see a comment from Richard Hogan saying it's a Kilkenny club. <laughs> that caused a bit of hassle with me and the uh, publishers, Shane, because uh, there is a lovely photograph on the ground in uh, Killarney, a uh, beautiful photograph of, of Killarney with the, with the lakes and the mountains, and they wanted that on it. And I said, no, I wanted to put it in a ground that epitomizes most of the grounds, and it is a Kilkenny ground. And I'm delighted to say it's in Freshford, Michael Kavanagh country. And uh, that showed, you know, I suppose, what most grounds are like. Like the big sexy grounds as Thurless and, uh, you know, uh, Porky Key from Porky uh, uh, and, and um, I suppose, McHale Park and Crow Park. That's only a very, very small number of grounds. They that ground in Freshford showed up to me. That's what it's all about. Yeah, I have a couple of friends uh, that I heard with in Kula from Freshford saying Lacton, so I might as well tell them it's on the cover now because your home ground is a kip. <laughs> That's what I'm gonna tell them anyway. I know you're not saying that. Well, if you turn to the back page, I don't know if you have the back cover or not. You probably don't, but it's uh, it's Parnell Park, so uh, that 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 showed up a medium sized ground with a with a good surrounding area. Actually, and seeing as you mentioned Dublin, uh, Dublin, you were appointed Dublin manager in November two thousand and three, or you know somewhere around then. Anyway, can you talk to me about what it was like taking over a Dublin team? Like you had been involved with Dave Marnock up in Port Marnock at the time. <laughs> What was it like getting involved in Dublin? Was there hope for the future? Was it a case of, sure, I'll go in and give it a crack? Or what was it like? Well, to be quite honest about it, Shane, the reason I was asked to take over Dublin hurling in 2004 was that nobody else would do it. It was really a, 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 a tough scenario. But what I did find when I went in, there was a lot of changes had to happen. I had to really bring in a whole new ethos of training, of coaching, of uh, you know the hurleys that they were playing with. I had to go down to Mullinahone and Tipperary uh, to to get hurleys down there to make sure that they were playing with decent hurleys. There was no ground. We were worse than the the the, the, the teams going around uh, at the clubs looking for various grounds. I didn't know where we were going to be training the next week or the following week. We had no such thing as a backup of 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 uh, you know uh, physicality of uh, upper, um, upper body strength any of that we were just in the third division in terms of preparation and i tried to bring in a new ethos of professionalism in that and i put a team around me that included sports psychologists 
uh, as a strength and conditioning coach from Australia. I brought in Jim Kilty from Tipperary. I brought in um, um, uh, uh, Byrne, uh, from Byrne from Tipperary. He played for Monahone as well. Uh, uh, a, a great uh, Kilkenny hurler. But it needed a little bit of a, a, a lift. However, the problem was that because it was starting from scratch, I brought in a lot of new lads. I'm proud to say that I brought in two guys who ultimately became all-stars, and that was Gary Maguire of uh, Ballyboden and uh, Alan McCrabb. Both of those were all-stars. But it, I, I would have told Dublin County Board at the time, listen, lads, this is going to be a long haul. But they didn't prepare for us, so they got rid of me two years later. But then, uh, you know, a couple of fellas, Anthony Daly came in and... Uh, Anthony did very, very well with them, in fairness, and the guys developed at that stage. But it does take a while. And any county that thinks that success is going to come overnight, they can forget about it. Were you surprised then to see the transfer of, I suppose, the power uh, in Dublin hurling from the north side team? So it had been Crave, Kieran, maybe Nafina, and so on and so forth. That then, up until this year when Nafina won it, there was like a huge period from, was it 07 onwards, when it was just south side teams only dominating? That, that is all right. God, Shane, you've done your research. It was 2006 was the last time that uh, Crave, Cor Crave Kieran won it. But I will give a little bit of a shout for the north side. This year in 2023, Nafina, north side, won the senior one. Uh, Crave Kieran won the division two. Nev Marnock won the division three. Finn Gallions won the intermediate. So I think that has turned around on its head a little bit. Now, I don't know if they can sustain that, but I'd love to see teams like O'Toole's, Crave Kieran and uh, St. Vincent's coming through because Dublin Hurling needs those. But more importantly, lads, what Dublin Hurling needs is a huge review of the coaching process in the county. We do not have enough of good coaches. Like Dublin Hurling, in my view, they have kind of accepted a level of, 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 uh, 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 of competence that is good enough, really, to win a Dublin Championship. But to go outside it and win a Leinster Championship, it is very, very a different story. So we need to be able to look across our coaching structures, definitely to be able to compete at All-Ireland level. We have the last All-Ireland one was 1938. The last All-Ireland in it was 1961. By the way, there's only one Dublin man, Jim Byrne is his name, has an All-Ireland medal. And when Dublin won six All-Irelands, they were all countries, like myself that actually uh, are, were on those teams. So only one Dublin man. And that's sad. A sad indictment of what's happening in Dublin. And I just I feel that they need to look at the coaches. But there is talent. Like, you know, having managed, managed Whitehall for a year as well, I can see raw materials there. Pitton hurling against football within clubs across the board is obviously not making it too easy either. Like, Humphrey, I was, I was calculating that the dual players who would play at the top end in both teams, or even if they're playing lower, they could have about 40 games between league championship and uh, challenge matches in the space of nine months. So I don't know how that helps you year on year to sort of hone a hurler or hone a hurling team. When you look at the differences between, say, the, the Clares and the Limericks and the Tipperaries against Dublin, what are the major factors that come out? I looked at the Clare match this year. I looked at it again when I was coming on with you because I tried to do a little bit of research when you're dealing with guys like yourselves who know everything about her. <laughs> <laughs> keep, keep massaging the egos, Humphrey. Keep massaging. <laughs> I'm trying to send the bloody book, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Good man. No, but there are three, and you know this. I mean, I'm not educating the people who know it, actually, but the physicality, when you saw the match against Clare, Tony Kelly ran through the, the Dublin defence uh, and scored two goals. Uh, yeah, he just left the guys in their way. Uh, David Fitzgerald ran through and, and caused two goals to happen. We don't have the, 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 the finesse or the ability to be able to read games as quickly as we should during the game. And that comes down to what I call mental fitness of the ability to take the right decisions, to cover off. Um, another match they played against Kilkenny this year, they played it down in Nolan Park. They walked the ball out of the fence with a sharp puck, came down the right-hand side, ran into uh, a, a roadblock. John Donnelly picked up the ball, didn't move two feet, and put the ball over the bar. And I said to myself, why is that happening? And that is the type of bad decisions that we have made over the years, not getting rid of the ball quickly enough, running and doing the wrong things in terms of striking. But the first touch is about 70%. And to be winning all Ireland, you need it at 95%. And that is maybe the differences to some degree. 
we're, we, we, we work very, very hard, very hard indeed. And there's nothing that Michael O'Donoghue left on turn to try to get this team. But if you don't do the right things on the day, you know, if you don't, if, you, if, if, you, if your ball isn't coming up the first time, if you haven't got pace, do we have anybody with real pace in Dublin? Do we have anybody who is real strength? I'm not too sure. Maybe Owen O'Donnell, maybe Paddy Smith. But after that, lads, there's not an awful lot you can say that would get on near another county team. Uh, you were involved, Humphrey, in the Blue Wave, I think, 20 years ago, or maybe it's 21 years ago at this stage. What's the getting numbers hurling in Dublin was the big thing then. Now you're talking to me, it's about, it's way more, we have the numbers, it's about quality now. Yeah, it, 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 it was the uh, blueprint for change, Michael. The Blue Wave came subsequently, but it's the same idea. And what we have to do, we have loads of children playing to hurling, but we have to show them how to play it right. You know, and it is, uh, you know, bending down to pick up the ball first time. I went out to a group, I've gone to lots of schools and places like that, and I asked them that, I hopped the ball in front of my tennis ball, in front of each of them, and I asked them to get it into their hand as quickly as possible. Shane, what did every child do? Well, I hopped the ball in front of them to, to put the ball into their hand as quickly as they can. They probably they tapped it the on the ground out. before rising it. I hopped it in front of them, but everybody put the hurley on to catch the ball. I said, why didn't you catch it? In your exactly, Michael. That's what they do in Offaly. And that's what we need. And by the way, I ended up playing for Offaly one day, just to let you know. I, I, have, I have a cap for Offaly. But anyway, that was a long, long time ago. But, you know, and you see, why would that child put the hurley out rather than the hand? What would you have done in Cork? What would you have done in Limerick? And that's only a minuscule, a minuscule piece of uh, experience that I have come across. The catching of the ball, the high... Uh, the high catching and the when you, when our forwards get the ball do we believe we're going to score a goal there's only um, uh, very few uh, examples that I have seen that where players will get the ball and they're going to go for a goal Tony Kelly he got the ball Shane O'Donnell they got the ball what did they do with it they put it in the net do we do that no there's a kind of an acceptance that we're going to be hooked or we're going to be blocked so belief is an awful good part, a, a huge part of it. But I also believe, in fairness to Michal Donahue, he's trying to get that right. And it will take time. I mean, Shane, you were involved in the uh, All-Ireland with Kula for two years. They were, you know, and we're all so proud of, of, of that happening. Why hasn't that continued on to other clubs, if that's the quality of hurling that was there a number of years ago? I'd say some clubs have. Like, look at the amount of the production line and the likes of Kilmacud Cokes, for example. Valley Bowden always have a huge amount of teams and players and so on and so forth. I don't know. I, I think the dual thing is so much of it, Humphrey, because if you took the very best hurlers in Dublin in the last 20 years, how many of them never played for Dublin because they were playing football for Dublin? Well, I came across that when I was with, when I had Colin Keeney and I had Dotsy Callaghan and those guys decided to go off and play uh, the football. And you wouldn't, you wouldn't deny them that because they had an absolutely great chance of winning in All-Ireland. However, but we have, to, we have to create that environment within the Dublin setup to believe that we can win in All-Ireland. If I said to Shane Stapleton uh, that if you uh, stick with me for three years, you'll win an All-Ireland hurling championship, you win a medal. Do you think he'll do it? But like, do you know, like Humphrey, like this year I watched the Dublin hurling championship begin before the footballers had even finished their season with, with the Dublin County team. You know, like I was involved in several games where county footballers who would make the Dublin senior hurling panel weren't even involved in the club games. You know, so no, but there was a culture of two clubs pitted against each other. The football will always go on top. They will because they know there's an all-Ireland chance there. But we don't create that expectation within Dublin to a large degree. And if when we have that... We have to have a little bit of innovative thinking. I, ha I, I have to uh, allude to uh, uh, one of your podcasts that I saw uh, Martin Fogarty on. And it was, it was rather depressing, I must say, to listen to, 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 Mike, uh, to, listen to uh, Martin and, 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 and his outcomes or his outputs from that particular role that he had in, in, in the, uh, w or the director of hurling. I think for the J, and, and, and it's not as depressing as it can be because we have to stop thinking the conventional way of running hurling in this country. We talk about a line up above Dublin and Galway. Like, I'm advocating that we have what they call hurling without borders. 
I talked to a coach in Ulster and I asked him, did he come across any particular hurler in the, his time of coaching? He said, there was a guy from Fermanagh who was as good a hurler I've ever seen. He had everything. He had left, right, physical, physicality, he had the whole lot. But he did not have a good environment. He didn't have a support system in place to play uh, for his county or to develop his game. And I said, what's he doing now? Asher, he's giving it up. Why? There are loads of people. You'll all know Keith Higgins in Mayo. Keith is a marvellous hurler. He won. He's the only Mayo man. He's the only Connacht man, actually, to have a medal in Leinster or in the uh, interprovincial hurling and football. Why is he, you know, on, on his own in a, in, in a county like Mayo? They shouldn't have that. They should have actually put in support systems very much that uh, 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 to, to support these players. Like the structures as laid out at the moment have failed. They have actually failed good hurlers in counties. Why? The GA must look at a different structure and to be a, a little bit of innovative thinking. And there's always a way to do it, lads, if we're prepared to act on it. There's no question about it. But we cannot think the same way. And I would think we should have a thing, I call it hurling without borders. Why should we have borders in hurling, especially in the north? Because of the traditional way of doing things. We're denying good opportunities, uh, good opportunities to very good potential hurlers if they could do uh, play the game. Like, I know that in my own county, we're very proud uh, in, in Watford. We're very proud when we get um, a player on the Fitzgibbon team or the, to, to win the Fitzgibbon and uh, Figgerson hurling um, uh, medal. That's, that's an achievement. That's hurling without borders. Let's do something in the north, something similar, without having to categorise you. Because you're from Tyrone, you're no good as a hurler, which is absolute rubbish. Basically, you're saying we should we should think outside the box, um, which is not something we're we're great at doing. Um, which is, you know, Humphrey, you've been absolutely brilliant with your time. Really appreciate it. You know, you might bring up that book again, um, an ama an amazing book, a real um stocking filler. You'd want to have a big stocking now to get it into it, but it's a great it's a great stocking filler. It's called a place to play. It it basically documents all 101 county GA grounds around the country. Uh, and Humphrey, a quick one for you. We had a question in from one of our viewers wondering, would you give, uh, would you put up a book for um, one of the viewers as a prize for if we picked out one of our viewers, maybe ran a competition over the next week? I'd be absolutely delighted to do so. And I, do you know what? I might even sign it for them as well. Oh, good oh, man. Good job. Thanks for that, Humphrey. I really appreciate it. Let's go, Humphrey. Thanks for your time. Cheers, Humphrey.